Um, Ananda, uh, the worldwide Ananda emanating from Ananda Village, has a very comprehensive website. And one feature of that website is something called Ask the Experts. And people who read that website can send in questions. And various uh, ones among us have been designated as the experts. And we write answers which are then published on that website. Um, for some reason, uh, the stream of questions relating to relationships and marriage and the attraction between people seem to have been my particular area of expertise, and I've been inundated of late. <laughs> I intend to protest. <laughs> but the uh, poignancy of it is, is part of the reason I don't want to keep answering these questions, because people are writing constantly about, uh, unfortunately, unfulfilled longing, or hopes gone awry, and it's... it's um, it's heartrending, in fact, to sort of feel people's desires being thwarted and the helpless sadness that they feel in the midst of this. Um, Paramahansa Yogananda um, spoke at one point, Swamiji tells us, in a couple of paragraphs, actually in the context of his commentary on the New Testament, about the concept of soulmates, which is something that everybody wants to know about. Every new set of new lovers declares that we are not merely lovers, but we are soulmates. We are destined by all eternity and <clears throat> to be together, always have been together, will always be together. And it goes on and on. When I was younger, I was more inspired by that. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> There's a quality to old marriage, which is so much dearer than new love that only those of us who have it really understand it. And we try to keep it kind of a secret from new lovers because they misread it. One of my dear friends once was having a, uh, let's see, actually the fact of the matter is that David and I were having a slight dispute. And our friends were in the living room with us and they observed that we were not sitting anywhere near each other. <laughs> and being very old friends and very old marrieds, they sort of said something cheeky about that observation. And, you know, we just admitted that things had been better and would be better in the future. And my friend said, just with great surprise, he said, well, you can't expect to always like the person you live with. You know, just like, of course, we all know this, don't we? And, of course, that was exactly true, oddly enough. You know, because the real bonds of love and affection are so much deeper than the mere superficial excitement that people expect. Now, coming back for a moment to what I was talking about with soulmates, is that Master spoke about it in one place, Swamiji tells us. And he, he spoke of it as, a, as a, a reality, that when the soul is created, it's created dual. And Master said, before you are God-realized, you must reunite with your soulmate, with your actual other half. But then, of course, he said, it has nothing to do with sexual attraction. Your soulmate may not even be on the same planet with you, that you may reunite in vision. And Swamiji says, Master never talked about it in any other place because he knew if anyone had the slightest idea that it was possible that we'd all be on the corner standing there advertising for our soulmates, you know, because of this deep longing within us for perfect love. And recently, Swamiji, speaking about this, made a very interesting comment. It just uh, it sort of apropos of nothing, he brought it up in a conversation when I was visiting recently. He said, the human being has such a deep desire for perfect love, for a kind of, he said, not merely a spiritual union, but a kind of emotional understanding. And he said, God would not have planted that desire in our hearts if he did not intend to fulfill it. And then he said he thought that concept of soulmates must in fact be true on the level that Master was speaking of it. Because you see, everything in this world is a tiny imitation. Sometimes they call it a poor Xerox copy of the real thing. It's all we have, um, all we have apparently, so we give ourselves to it with so much passion and fervor 
you know, and it all is so amazingly and intensely real and serious to us that it's very, very hard um, just as an idea to think beyond it. So we find ourselves in this interesting conundrum as devotees where God is always talking to us through the great masters of this potential of perfect love. And then what we have around us is this desperate effort to manifest that perfect love through this exceedingly imperfect world. And the process of what I would say developing through experience a deeper and deeper faith in God's promise is what the spiritual path is all about. And a faith in that promise that's strong enough to allow us to risk everything for it. And by risking everything, I mean by constantly holding our attention at the highest reality and disciplining ourselves against every lesser, what I can only call a temptation. Now, it's important to understand in this, especially in the path that Master brought us, that this is a very common sense path. And although not really a path of moderation, in the sense that that which is being asked of us is not small, but it is a path in which we are allowed and encouraged to discover divine truth by living it as perfectly as we can in the human world. But we must never make the mistake of thinking that any kind of fulfillment in a merely egoic sense is really what God is talking about. I remember a friend of mine who attends this church sometimes who is extremely family oriented in you might call a traditional Christian sense became very suspicious once and came to me with this almost in an accusatory way thinking that saying that I don't think you at Ananda really believe in family and I had to admit that on one level we don't you know once you add reincarnation into the picture of course it makes a very different uh, reality out of husbands and wives and children even though in the moment we are deeply allied to one another and asked by God to serve each other with perfect selfless attention and that discipline of loving one another and bearing children and raising them conscientiously is an ideal divine sadhana and that's why God sucks us into it honestly he, he fills us with this uh, impelling desire to find a mate and to raise children and then after it gets going what we discover is that this is really spiritual discipline this is not actually personal fulfillment at least not in the way that I thought it was going to be which is that effortless ease of emotional comfort that we're always looking for. In these many letters that I am asked to answer, they're almost all about unrequited love. And the question is always, why would God give me this desire if he wasn't going to be fulfilling it? Well, honey, I can think of a lot of reasons. <laughs> That's what I say first, and then I breathe in and out, and I uh, sit down at my typewriter and try to find something a little more supportive. And now coming to where we are, which is our last Sunday service before Christmas. We have this extraordinary story <clears throat> of the birth of the baby Jesus. And it's just so full of charm and magic and majesty, especially as the centuries have passed and people have tried to make it more and more extraordinary. And we add layer and layer of miracle onto it. And I say, why not? You know? And as um, we often think about here the particular sweetness of being able to love a baby. You know, brings out of all of us uh, a, a tenderness of heart, a receptivity to loving and being loved that almost nothing else can do. You know, in our community now, we have the imminent birth of uh, twins coming soon. 
And I think all of us are thinking about the day when we get to hold those little babies and that wonderful baby softness and all the things that come of it. And the reason that we're attracted to it is because we all long for that kind of perfect love. And what we have to understand, but the difficulty, of course, with babies <clears throat> is they turn into us. You know, uh, when uh, Viraj's mother was here, who's now in her 80s and is sort of shriveled and small, and she was sort of walking small like that, and Viraj is, let's just say he's not a small man, let's put it that way. He's standing next to his mom, and I said, it's really hard to believe that he was once inside your womb, isn't it? I mean, how did something so massive emerge? You know? It's always like that, isn't it? I remember my father saying to me, and I have to admit he said it with tears in his eyes because he saw the inevitability of my separation from him. The child disappears into the adult, he said. And then he said, it's hard. It's hard on the parent. I watched uh, once a young girl, darling young girl, she was about five. I happened to be at a vantage point where I could see this sort of like half a football field length. I was up on a hill and they were down below. She spied her father. I had a very close tie with my father, so daughter-father relationships always touch me especially. She cried out, Daddy, like that, and raced across this huge difference and then just launched herself at him with the perfect faith that she would be received. And he, of course, was there and just grabbed her up like that. The most perfect love that we can even imagine doesn't begin to touch the perfect love of God. And that's why the masters are born continuously into this world because they want us to understand not that we're here for sorrow and suffering, but that there is a power within us that can transcend everything. Because the difficulty is that this world is a trickster. And yes, it has its deep and glorious moments. But the more we cling to those moments for the value they have in themselves, the more they're like trying to lift up water. You lift it up, your hands become a little wet, but where is the substance to it? It just falls away. And pretty soon, even worse, our hands dry. And we have the memory, but we no longer have the reality. Whereas the divine symbolized by the glorious birth of this glorious baby who is heralded by this great star that the wise men follow. And this whole story is, yes, it's the birth specifically of Jesus. For Jesus was and is a great master who guides us by his living consciousness if we will receive it. He is a perfect lover for all who rise to his vibration and meet him there, the, tr the tradition of Catholic nuns, which is not well respected and is falling out of practice, but nonetheless is an exquisitely beautiful one, is that each of those nuns at a certain point becomes the bride of Christ. They vow never to marry in the human world and some of the orders will wear a wedding ring. And for those women who have the ability to inwardly see that star. And that star is not a Christian or yogic symbol. It's a reflection of the, of the inner energy. Every human being at a certain state of realization sees that star. And for every one of us, we are guided by that star to the place where Jesus is born. Jesus the man inhabited one body at one time, but Jesus the Christ dwells always within us. And that star is the image we see in the stillness of meditation. And to follow that star, to be determined to find that star, and to find that star 
is to withdraw our committed, our commitment for happiness from every transitory reality until the only commitment we have is to the divine within us. Now, on one level, this looks to people like renunciation. Like, why would I do that? And it's a very good question. And until you can honestly and truthfully answer that question from your own experience, there's really nothing much to do except just go on and go on and keep trying and keep trying. But at a certain point, I presume in everyone's life in this room, it has is, it is come into our awareness that everything that we're seeking is not really an endless chase outside of us, but somehow the inner world is the world we must cultivate. Some t one time I was trying to understand if there was any way to describe in a simple term the, quote, demographic of who is attracted to this path of self-realization. Naturally, we need and want to communicate our teachings in the best way possible. As we say, we don't try to convert, but we do advertise. Yogananda himself said, if Wrigley, this when he was criticized for advertising his spiritual teachings, he said, if Wrigley can advertise chewing gum, he said, I can advertise good ideas for people to chew on. That's how he put it. <laughs> he had a very sort of homely way about saying it. So often we try to think, how can we let more people know? And that desire to let people know is just the enthusiasm of having a good thing and wanting to share it with others. There's no compulsion here to save the world. But if people are suffering, and these good ideas can help alleviate and clarify their understanding of life, why not? But I realize the single unifying principle is that somewhere along the way, before a person actually even becomes aware of this teaching, what to speak of actually being magnetized to it and the step further to actually begin to change their life, to align to it, is that somewhere one has understood that there is an inner reality and cultivating that inner reality if not, if not the first priority, is at least a high priority in one's life. And then once we begin to cultivate that inner reality, the question simply becomes, how deeply will I commit myself to doing that? Now, as I was saying earlier, on this path that Master has given us, as is self-evident by looking at our communities and our community leaders and everything about our community, you know, here we are. We live more or less like everyone lives. In fact, when a certain reporter came to our community once at Ananda Village, he was a little disappointed because he was hoping that we would look really strange and that he could get a really exotic story about how these weird people living out in the country there in the Sierra Nevada, you know, he just was very disappointed. And uh, he was sitting with Swami Kriyananda and in one way or another more tactfully than that, he expressed his... <clears throat> surprise that we seem so ordinary and Swamiji said yes except that we put God first and he just said it like that the reporter just went right over his head he didn't have any idea what was said but you see when you put God first everything changes because somewhere through all our incarnations we've begun to understand that there is a perfect love and that everything the heart longs for will be fulfilled but we simply have to to seek that and find it where it really exists it's not that people can't be kind to each other it's not that we don't really with with noble um, self-sacrifice love one another but the problem is it's all us and our very capacity to give and our very capacity to love is limited. And for that perfect fulfillment, we have to put ourselves in relationship to that and to, to, to that reality which can love us completely. And this is the magnetic power of that baby Jesus. Because not only does he himself love us personally now, 
and I don't just mean did, but does. The great lovers of Jesus, Teresa of Avila was one. Jesus would appear to her all the time. She was a nun who was married to Jesus. And she would, at the time that she lived in Spain, she was of a very high social caste, and uh, even though the nuns were cloistered, they, they could meet be, from behind a grill all the regular society. And so she was constantly being called to the parlor by various noble visitors who wanted to be edified by her company. And she would grow very weary of their, of their worldly interests. And so she, was often, she would often say, excuse me, I must leave you now. I have a visitor waiting for me in my cell, her nun's cell. And she would go there and Jesus himself would be there. She would feel his call. St. Francis of Assisi, as Master said, used to walk hand in hand with Jesus around the pathways of Assisi. And there's a little um, chapel where he used to meditate, where he said Jesus would come and sit on the altar and they would commune and converse together. Time and space are no barrier for these great souls. Why would a woman like Teresa of Avila, like St. Francis of Assisi, who had every advantage, both came from wealth and position and comfort, both gave up everything to live lives that looked from the outside like extraordinary sacrifice and hardship, you know that the average human mind says, why? But the deeper thinking human mind says, why? Why would they? And then in the lives of those great ones, you see the promise of the Master fulfilled. What the Master promises us is, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's really extraordinary to meditate on, isn't it? You know, and it's a meditation that we can have endlessly over and over again. We picture that little infant holding in our arms, you see, and the baby, for so many people, I myself always expected that I would cradle many of my own babes in my arms. It was very interesting to me. When I became serious about the spiritual path, Almost in that moment, I lost interest in having children of my own because I saw that what I was seeking through this, I would only find through the infinite. And I don't in any respect impose that teaching on anyone else. It was just even still a marvel to me that what had been in fact the defining desire of my life up to that point just over for the other but the image of the baby because you see what does that do as soon as you hold that baby you know when you're holding the baby especially the newborn I know some of you have had this experience others can imagine it's just a moment of perfect love where would you be except with that baby what would you want except that baby what inhibition is there to the complete openness of your heart? And when you look into the eyes of the child, all you see is the same sort of unconditioned love and affection coming back to us. Everything in this world is a symbol of the perfection that is going to be ours and that is really ours already. This time of Jesus when there is such a particular sweetness. You know, we years ago went to Rome and bought that little baby Jesus. Bambino Gesù, of course they call him, you know. And he's just a porcelain doll. But it has been my privilege many times to get to carry that doll. In fact, the first time we did our children's service, it was before we had that when we had a midwife's model of a newborn which perfect child looking had this little hand you know it was just exactly so and it was the very first time we'd done our, our children's Christmas service and I was going to be telling the story of Jesus and I was trying to get in tune with it and so I sat in my own house with this little baby in my arms and I became so engaged with that child I went out to the car and some people in the community does Asha have a baby <laughs> But I was 
I was touched because I'm sure it wasn't just that I was carrying it, but it was my baby. And all of that aura, you know, that, that comes over a new mother was just, I was having the delightful experience of having it. St. Joseph of Cupertino was a great saint, Italian saint, and he had the habit of levitation, which is very inconvenient in the Catholic Church when somebody, um, one priest is, seems to be more ordained than the others. So they tend to take the ones that are too, too much ordained and therefore sort of mess up their system and they hide them somewhere. They literally hid him in this apartment several floors down in the Basilica of St. Francis and he was confined down there in virtual seclusion for months, years, I don't know how long. Now you can go through and visit his apartment, which is just vibrant with saintliness. He has there a little doll, a little Jesus doll, which used to be an integral part of his spiritual life, all by himself. In the silence of that apartment, he had the baby Jesus. And you sort of see this doll, and you know, our sophisticated uh, Western minds just don't even know what to do with that. But in the privacy of your own home, pick up such a doll and hold it in your arms and feel that it is for you, the power and the presence of God being born within you, and you'll understand immediately. You know, what a gift this story is. What a gift this season is. Take it into ourselves, let it grow within us and be our reality. Radiate that affection, that love, that divine acceptance of the perfect mother to all whom we meet. This is what we have to give. This is what the masters give to us. And it is the one gift that we are asked to give to all. Bless you.